What's up, everyone? We are your internet historians, and we are back for another episode. So, um, first of all, we just want to start off the episode by saying that Lisa will not be with us, unfortunately, in this episode, and possibly for a few more episodes, future episodes that we have planned. Um, she just had some family emergency stuff that she had to deal with, but so it'll just be Alec and I for the next couple of episodes. Hope you're okay mm-hmm. with that. <laughs> Um, So, in today's episode, we will be discussing the history behind the movie 12 Years a Slave. In the years before the Civil War, Solomon Northup, a free black man from upstate New York, is kidnapped and sold into slavery in the South. Subjected to the cruelty of one malevolent owner, he also finds unexpected kindness from another, as he struggles continually to survive and maintain some of his dignity. Then, in the 12th year of the disheartening ordeal, a chance meeting with an abolitionist from Canada changes Solomon's life forever. So, <laughs> how'd you like it, Alec? Um, I actually really like this movie. Like, I was kind of scared to watch it from everything that I had heard, and then what you were saying, and then what Lisa was saying about it just, like, being really sad and slightly hard to watch and so I was a bit worried but I actually liked it I think more than Lincoln like I don't know oh, it, yeah it, it it was there were parts that were definitely hard to watch and upsetting but I think overall like visually it was a really beautiful movie like cinematography wise and the in the sound design and the sound editing was really well done and so I think just overall like as a film even though the subject matter was hard to watch, the, the the film itself was really nice to watch aesthetically, I guess. <laughs> yeah, totally. I 100% agree with you. Like, obviously, it was a little bit difficult to watch, it, like you said, on some parts. But I think overall, just, again, just reiterating everything you said and, like, how it visually, how it looked was really nice and everything just every aspect of it was really good. And I just, yeah, I just think that it's important also to have something like that telling of like a historical thing because you don't you want people to appreciate it I guess or appreciate the history behind it more and I feel like like Lincoln unfortunately because it was a little bit stale and dry it's like I don't know I feel like leaving the theater I feel like people wouldn't I don't know feel connected I guess to that type of history and I feel like this definitely makes you like feel you are more understanding of what happened historically and of this person and want to learn more about the person and the history behind the movie. And I like that this movie actually ended with like the little blurb at the end that like, you know, said what happened after, you know, he was freed and stuff, which actually like makes you want to do more research. I mean, it says at the very beginning, oh, it's based on a true story. And but then you watch all this stuff and you're just kind of I feel like it, it kind of goes back and forth, your your suspension of b- disbelief or whatever, I guess. I mean, that's probably an incorrect use of that word, but it's it's so horrible. But then, like, there is kindness shown to him. And at the same time, so I was just like, I don't know. It actually made me want to read the book, but I didn't have time, obviously, <laughs> to read it. Because I did find it. It is, it is online. Uh, the University of Northern uh, – or of North Carolina has it online as, like – I guess it's, like, public domain, I guess, because it's, like, over a certain amount of years old as public domain. So you can go on their – the school's website and read it, and it's – Pretty lengthy, so unfortunately, unlike Lisa, who was able to read Black Klansman <laughs> before we recorded, I just did not have time. Yeah, I was interested in that as well. How many pages was it? Did you, like, happen to look at that? or? Oh, gosh. Because I could imagine it'd be a long story having been 12 years that he was a slave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it says page 309. So it's a... It's a decent length, but like I said, it's all one really long web page, so <laughs> good luck, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I really, and of course, doing this research too, we really get to see how close the movie was in relation to the um, the book as well, which I thought was really cool because obviously we know things are, you know, sensationalized for film, but I don't know. I think it's actually also very respectful since it was, you know, something so serious to kind of try and match it up as close as they could for the film but yeah so should should we should we get into discussing solomon north up here delve deep a little well delve deep is not that deep (laughs) there really isn't that much i mean which i'm sure we will say multiple times it's like he's kind of what's the word like an anomaly kind of there isn't really there's like there's this account, which is his book that is that he wrote, and then it, it, there's the other people's accounts or whatever. But like him as a person, it's kind of hard to find any information on like before this happened, after this happened. So 
All right, let's get into his uh, family history. So Solomon Northup was born on July 10th, 1807 or 1808. So it's kind of just like, it's this or it's that. We don't really know. <laughs> his father, Mintus, was a freedman who had been a slave in his early life in, in service to the Northup family. Born in Rhode Island, he was taken with the Northups when they moved to Hoosick, New York. His master, Captain Henry Northup, freed Mintus, his dad, in his will. You know, Upon his death, he said he was a free man. After being freed by Henry Northup, Mintus adopted the surname Northup as his own. So that's why Solomon's last name is Northup. Uh, Mintus Northup married and moved his wife, a free woman of color, to the town of Minerva in New York. Three, their two sons, Solomon and Joseph, were born free according to a legal doctrine of the time, as their mother was a free woman. That meant that the children's status was free. Solomon described his mother as a quadroon, meaning that she was one quarter African and three quarters European. A farmer, Mintus Northup, was successful enough to own land and thus meet the state's property requirements for the right to vote. From 1821 on, when it revised its constitution, the state retained the property requirement for black people but dropped it for white men, thus expanding their franchise. It is notable that Mintus Northup was able to save enough money as a freedman to buy land that satisfied this requirement and registered to vote. He provided an education for his two sons at a level considered high for free black people at the time. As, boy, as boys, Northup and his brother worked on the family farm. I tried to look, did you look at all into his wife, Anne, because I couldn't find too much. I feel like this is like a P.T. Barnum situation where it's just like the wife doesn't matter, just I forgotten guess. forgotten about, I don't know. yeah. Yeah, she just is, falls to the wayside, so I don't have too much. But in 1828 or 1829, <laughs> Solomon married Anne Hampton, a woman of color. They have that in quotes. She was African, European, and Native American descent. Between 1830 and 1834, the couple lived in Fort Edward and Kingsbury, small communities in Washington County, New York. They had three children, which I believe they only show two in the movie. No, they show um, three. Oh, yeah, they, they actually show just show, yeah, they only no, show I two, think, yeah. Yeah, they only show uh, Margaret and Alonzo, but they also had another daughter named Elizabeth. They owned a farm in Hebron, New York, and supplemented their income by various jobs. In his later memoir, Northup describes his love for his wife as sincere and unabated since the time of their marriage and his chil and his children as beloved. So Northrop had various jobs, including working as a raftsman, which he kind of brings up in the movie to um, Benedict Cumberbatch's character. Uh, he built a fine reputation as a, as a fiddler, <laughs> playing violin, and was in high demand to play for local dances. Anne became notable as a cook and worked for local taverns, which served food and drink. After selling their farm in 1834, the Northups moved 20 miles to Saratoga Springs, New York. That's what my background is. <laughs> I was just like, oh, Saratoga Springs, um, for its employment opportunities. Northup played his violin at several well-known hotels in Saratoga Springs, though he found its seasonal cycles of employment difficult. He was busy during the summer, but work was scarce at other times. He worked at an assortment of jobs, constructing the Champlain Canal and the railroad, and as, and as a skilled carpenter. Anne worked from time to time as a cook at the United States Hotel and other public houses, and she was highly praised for her culinary skills. When court was in, se in session at the county seat at Fort Edward, she worked at Cheryl's Coffee House in Sandy Hill to earn extra money, which I think they kind of talk about in the movie because I was kind of confused. I don't know, and I might have just, like, missed the line or something like that, but they made it sound like, oh, she needs to go away for, a, for like, the season or something like that, and I was just like, where is she going? What is she doing for her job? I think they, they kind of alluded to the fact that it was for work. Okay. Because yeah, was like, they, another, yeah, like, how you said, another season has passed. It's that time of year again? I mean, that's a, yeah, so that's about where the movie starts. She leaves town to go to work. So, in 1841, at age 32, Northup met two men who introduced themselves as Merrill Brown and Abram Hamilton. Saying they were entertainers, members of a circus company, they offered him a job as a fiddler for several performances in New York City. Expecting the trip to be brief, Northup did not notify Anne, who was working in Sandy Hill at the time. When they reached New York City, the men persuaded Northup to continue with them for a gig with their circus in, DC, in Washington, D.C., offering him a generous wage and the cost of his return trip home. They stopped so that he could get a copy of his free papers, which documented his status as a free man. His status was a concern as he was traveling to Washington, where slavery was legal, which 
I don't, I feel like I should have known that after we did the whole Lincoln episode, but for some reason in my brain, Washington, D.C., like, has, like, a special, like, status because it, like, is the capital, so I guess I didn't really think of it being legal there because they were still, I don't know, it just is kind of interesting. It's, like, its own little, I don't know, <laughs> area, so I didn't even think about that. And the city had one of the, na- the nation's largest slave markets, and slave catchers were not above kidnapping free black people. At this time, 20 years before the Civil War, the expansion of cotton cultivation in the Deep South had led to a continuing high demand for healthy slaves. Kidnapper, kidnappers used a variety of means from forced abduction to deceit and frequently abducted children who were easier to control. It is possible that, quote, Brown and, quote, Hamilton incapacitated Northup. Um, his symptoms suggest that he was drugged with belladonna and sold him to Washington slave traders uh, James H. Birch for $650, claiming that he was a fugitive slave. However, Northup stated in his account of the ordeal in the book, 12 Years a Slave, in Chapter 2, quote, whether they were accessory to my misfortunes, subtle and inhuman monsters in the shape of men, designedly luring me away from home and family and liberty for the sake of gold. Those who read these pages will have the same means of determining as myself. So that was kind of one thing that I read a lot when I was researching was that he doesn't, in his book, he doesn't even say either way if he thinks that they were a part of it. He kind of is just like, well, this is how I felt. I don't know if they were mm-hmm. responsible. You I think can he's decide way that for too, Yeah, I think he's way too forgiving of some of the people in that led to the circumstances, at least, and which I am is kind of, I guess, cool about him because, like, even though he went through all this crazy stuff, he's still like, well, I don't know, like that, whatever. Me, I'd be like, that mother yeah. did this to me, and da, da, da. but like, I don't know, that's commendable, I guess, especially considering all the circumstances and things he had to go through. So, yeah, definitely. Birch and Ebenezer Radburn, his jailer, severely beat Northup to stop him from saying he was a free man. Birch then wrongfully presented Northup as a slave from Georgia. So this is all like the movie like it pretty much is very on point with pretty much how it went. Um, Northup was held in the slave pen of trader William Williams. What a name. Close to the United States Capitol. Birch shipped Northup and other slaves by sea to New Orleans in what was called the Coastwise Slave Trade, where Birch's partner, Theophilus Freeman, these names, Theophilus Freeman, would sell them. During the voyage, Northup and the other slaves caught smallpox. A slave named Robert died of the disease en route. So that's kind of where they kind of take a creative liberty there. So they do show someone, Robert, they, I think he's actually even a name character, dying but he died sort of standing up to one of the sailors as he was going to assault mm. one of the female slaves. So, but they really, in reality, just caught smallpox. I say just caught smallpox, but smallpox is bad. It's not, it's not a little thing to catch. So, um, Northrop persuaded John Manning, an English sailor, to send to send to Henry B. Northup upon reaching New Orleans a letter that told of his kidnapping and illegal enslavement. Henry was a lawyer, the son of the man who had once held Solomon's father as a slave and freed him, and a childhood friend of Solomon's. So that might be confusing later when I talk about Henry B. Solomon, but Henry is white, and he's just a, not really related. Yeah, related he just they name. just have the same last name because he was the son of Solomon Northup's master. Master. Yeah, because they were friendly, which I was like, that's interesting that I don't know that even after like they were freed by the father, they like were still friendly, I guess, with the family enough for yeah. him to, you know, be in yeah. his life or know him. Uh, the New York state legislature had passed a law in 1840 to protect its African-American residents by providing legal and financial assistance to aid the recovery of of any who were kidnapped and taken out of state and illegally enslaved. Henry Northup was willing to help but could not act without knowing where Solomon was held. So he did get the letter from the sailor, but pretty much everybody was like, well, until he gets to his final destination, we can't do anything. At the New Orleans slave market, Birch's partner, Theo, Theophilus Freeman, sold Northup, who had been renamed Platt, like in the movie, um, along with Harry and Eliza. Eliza was renamed 
Drady or Dratty, which is an interesting name, um, to William Prince Ford, which was uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's character. He was a preacher who engaged in small form, small farming on Bayou. So we're going to get down to the south in Louisiana, and there's going to be a lot of things in French, and I just do not know how to pronounce them. <laughs> so on Bayou Beauf, Beef, Beauf? Bayou sure. Beauf. That's what I'm going to go with. Of the Red River in northern Louisiana. Uh, Ford was then a Baptist preacher. In his memoir, Northup wrote, In my opinion, there... There never was a more kind, noble, candid Christian man than William Ford. The influences and associations that had always surrounded him blinded him to the inherent wrong at the bottom of the system of slavery. So he liked Ford because, you know, Ford saw his talents. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, he, like, wrote about him as if he was a nice guy. But I'm like, he still had slaves. He was still a slave owner and still participated in that whole thing. So it's not like he was above any of that. He was just not as vicious as some of the other people that um, Northup had to deal with who were also slave owners. So I think maybe in comparison, he was a lot better. But I still am like, he still owns slaves, so he's not a good guy. But... Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I guess that's the kind of why he says, like, the system of slavery, like, he knows it's wrong, but this is the way it goes type of a thing. But, um, yeah, the, from what I was reading, they, I mean, I guess they kind of do, because from what I was reading, they said that the portrayal of him in the movie was definitely more of a negative than everything that Northup wrote about him in the book. So, I and I didn't that see that. I know, I didn't really even, I don't know. I think like, because, well, what what they said was, like, the juxtaposition of basically him preaching and then the girl crying or whatever. Yeah. And, but I'm like, but still, he was, like, still portrayed, I feel like, as if he was, like, a good, good slave master in quotations. So, I don't know. I didn't see that, but. Yeah, because I feel like, I don't know, they, like, want us to blame Benedict Cumberbatch's character for the separation of was it Eliza and her kids but at the same time it was kind of Paul Giamatti's character who wouldn't make him the deal to give them the kids too I don't know so I don't know so at Ford's place in Pine Woods Northup assessed the problem of getting timber off Ford's farm to market. He proposed making log rafts to move lumber down the narrow Indian Creek in order to transport the logs more easily and less expensively than overland. He was familiar with this process from previous work in New York, and Ford was delighted to see his project was a success. Northup used his carpentry skills to build looms, copying from one nearby so that Ford could set up mills on the creek. With Ford, Northup found his efforts appreciated, but the planter came into financial difficulties and had to sell 18 slaves to settle his debts. He sold 17 to a neighboring planter named Compton. Solomon could not pick cotton, however, so Ford found a buyer and a local tradesman. So this is what was interesting to me. Did you get the impression that he sold Solomon to Paul Dano's character, Tibbet, or whatever his name is? Tibbet? Tibbet? Mm, I feel like in the the film, they portrayed it as almost as if Tibbet was someone who worked for Ford. Exactly. That's That's what I thought, too. Like, yeah, I thought, what do they call it? Like, an overseer. Like, yeah, I thought that his character was, like, the overseer working for Benedict Cumberbatch, but... I don't know, but I mean, and maybe that's how they wanted us to see it, but it's like reading further. I was just like, it was a whole separate situation, yeah. which is interesting. Um, so in the winter of 1842, uh, Ford sold Northup to John M. Tibbet, a carpenter who had been working for Ford on the mills. He also had helped construct a weaving house and corn mill on Ford's bayou plantation. Ford owed Tibbet money for the work. Since the amount Ford owed Tibbet was less than the purchase price agreed upon for Solomon, Ford held a chattel mortgage on Northup for $400, the difference between the two amounts. Under Tibbet, Northup suffered suffered cruel and capricious treatment. Tibbet used him to help complete construction at Ford's plantation. At one point, Tibbet whipped Northup because he did not like the nails Northup was using, which they show in the movie. Uh, But Northup fought back, beating Tibbet severely, severely. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we're I'm like, yeah, beat him, beat him. <laughs> Enraged, Tibbet recruited two friends to lynch and hang the slave, which a master was legally entitled to do. So that's another thing. That, that's what threw me because I was just like, he didn't seem like he was the master of Solomon. So I was just like, how does he have the right to, I mean, not that he yeah. has the right, but like, yeah. No, well, I think even I feel like in the movie too, when the, the Chapin dude, when he came out, I feel like he was telling Tibbet like, oh, you 
basically like if you kill him, then you're going to owe Ford money or something like that. So that's why I was like, oh, he must just be someone that works for Ford. Ford's overseer, Chapin, interrupted and prevented the men from killing Northup, reminding Tibbet of his debt to Ford and chasing them off at gunpoint. Northup was left bound and noosed for hours until Ford returned to cut him down. Northup believed that Tibbet's debt to Ford saved his life. Historian Walter Johnson suggests that Northup may well have been the first slave Tibbet ever bought, marking his transition from traveling employee to property owning master. Hmm. So, I mean, so okay, he did so seem young and dumb. <laughs> so he bought, or he Ford sold Northup to Tibbet, but then Tibbet still had a debt to Ford. I guess that's where the confusion is. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. So yeah, because it seemed like Ford. Ford needed to pay Tibbet for his work or whatever. But then I think there was a price difference in what he owed Tibbet for that work and what Tibbet wanted to buy. I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just anyway, uh, they're just, yeah, I don't know. But they, they both owed. <laughs> they were fighting each other. over farms yeah. and slaves and whatever. Hey, yeah. So Tibbet, who had a low reputation locally, hmm, decided at another point to kill Northup. When the two men were alo- alone, Tibbet seized an axe and swung it to hit Northup, but he again defended himself. With his bare hands, he strangled Tibbet to the point of unconsciousness. Northup ran away through swamps so that dogs could not track him, making his way back to Ford, with whom he stayed for four days. The planter convinced Tibbet to hire out Northup to limit their conflict and take the fees he could generate so i feel like they kind of condense that because he kind of does seek refuge in ford's house but then ford's kind of like there this is going to keep happening there isn't so much there isn't that much i can do for you tibbet hired northup out to planter to a planter named eldret who lived about 38 miles south on the red river at what he called the big cane break Eldret had Northup and other slaves clear cane, trees, and undergrowth in the bottomlands in order to develop cotton fields for cultivation. With the work unfinished, after about five weeks, Tibbet sold Northup to Edwin Epps. Yikes. Epps we do not like. (laughs) None of them. (laughs) I mean, yeah. He's the worst one, though. It's like, goes from okay to awful. Yeah. So. So Epps in the movie is uh, Michael Fassbender's character. One thing, though, I mean, I mean, I could have I barely read the article about his interview with with an interview with Michael Fassbender about his role in this. But I don't know. I didn't really care for his like response on like because they asked him, like, how did he could portray like, you know, a character like this? Like, how did he like basically like where did you go to within yourself to create Uh this? And I don't know. He kind of made FC more like of a humane person when with how he described and depicting him like oh well he was dealing with all this stuff and whatever which I get like you have to kind of create something for the character you're portraying but I'm like no he was just a cruel person this is just who like he's just an evil person like there's no justification for it so I I mean I of course I didn't read the entire article but I read that and I was like (laughs) nope I'm done with this I was already getting upset but (laughs) but anyway yeah, I mean, it's kind of as you said, like, I feel like it's like the only way that he could like justify it to himself is like he had to like think of the time and think of everything he was going through. But it's just like now from our view, it's just like, I yeah. don't know, seems pretty inexcusable. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Epps held North up for almost 10 years until 1853. Uh, he was cruel. He was a cruel master who frequently and indiscriminately punished slaves and drove them hard. His policy was to whip slaves if they did not meet daily work quotas he set for pounds of cotton to be picked, among other goals. Northup wrote that the sounds of whipping were heard every day at Epps' plantation from sundown until lights out. Epps sexually abused a young young enslaved woman named Patsy, repeatedly raping her. That would be Lupita Nyong'o's character. Uh, This led to additional severe physical and mental abuse prompted by Epps' wife, the mistress of the plantation, which is Sarah Paulson's character. You and talking about Brad Pitt. Okay, so I mean, of course, as we were saying, the movie is pretty accurate to the. I mean, the movie. Yeah, the movie and the book are pretty accurate of each other. Um, you know, when Northup meets Bass, he hears him kind of talking about his abolitionist ideals, and he feels comfortable enough to open up to Bass and inform him that he was kidnapped into slavery, and that he was, you know, born a free man. And so, yeah, of course, that's all correct and real. But I feel like the film kind of very um what is it they left a not a lot out but they left some of the means i guess that bass had to do to tell people that northup yeah. was free they kind of just show more of um what solomon had to deal with you know when he was still on the plantation and whatnot 
So in the movie, Bass says that he will deliver the letter in which Northup writes, and he does, in fact, do this. But Bass also does more than just deliver the one letter. Um, he mails a letter, of course, and then he also writes several letters himself to Northup's friends, providing general information about Northup's location. As Bass says in the movie, he did this under great personal risk. He did this after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, which, again, we've talked about in multiple episodes. And this basically this act uh, increased fed- federal penalties against people assisting slaves to escape. So, again, he was kind of trying to do this on the low low so no one or himself, he didn't get caught. One of the letters Bass wrote reached Cephas, Parker, and William Perry, who Parker, again, was the one who went to the plantation to grab um, Northup out of there. They were storekeepers in Saratoga who knew Northup. Parker or Perry forwarded the letter to Northup's wife, Anne, who contacted attorney Henry B. Northup, which is who Alex spoke of before, <laughs> who was the son of Solomon's father's former master. Henry B. Northup contacted New York Governor Washington Hunt, who took up the case, appointing the attorney general as his legal agent. Once Northup's family was notified, his rescuer still had to do detective work to find the enslaved man, as he had partially tried to hide his location for protection in case the letters fell into the wrong hands, which is smart. Um, Mm -hmm. And Bass, of course, he didn't use his real name either. So they were both kind of writing. If they were caught, they obviously wouldn't be, like, found out because, as we saw in the film, something happened where his his plan to write these letters was kind of, um, what is it, foiled, I guess, and it was, like, revealed to Epps. Yeah, which actually did happen. Arms be the the oh. the white guy. <laughs> From what uh, I read, they said it was true, and he straight up believed that he. I mean, Epps straight up believed Solomon that he mm-hmm. didn't that he didn't write it, and the only reason why he made up that lie was because he he wants him to be an overseer and all of that. Yeah. And I was just like, dang, that's a good lie. <laughs> that was a good lie. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, they had to find documentation of his free status as a citizen and New York resident. Henry B. Northup took the precaution of bringing with him the sheriff of Marksville, the parish seat, to enforce the law. In cooperation with U.S. Senator Pierre Soule from Louisiana and other local authorities, Henry B. B. Northup arrived in Marksville on January 1st, 1853. Tracing Northup was difficult as he was known locally only by his slave name of Platt. When the attorney confronted Epps with the evidence that Platt, a.k.a. Northup, was a free man with a wife and children, Epps first demanded demanded of the enslaved man why he had not told him that at the time of purchase. Then Epps said, had he known that men were coming to take Platt, he would have ensured they could never take the slave alive. Epps cursed the man, who, the man which being Bass, who had helped Northup and threatened to kill him if he ever learned his identity. Northup later wrote, Epps thought of nothing but his loss and cursed me for having been born free. Attorney Henry B. Northup convinced Epps that if it would be futile to contest the free papers in a court of law, so the planter conceded the case. He signed papers giving up all claim to Northup. Finally, on January 4th, 1853, four months after meeting Bass, Northup regained his freedom. So yeah, Ooh. that's all the journey. I mean, it was a lot of letter writing. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. But one thing I did want to I just briefly mention about Bass, too, because there's not really, like, a history record of him. I did find a couple of things about him, basically, that he was, you know, from Canada. He actually, I guess, had a wife and some kids in Canada, but he mm-hmm. left them because he basically was not in a good relationship with his wife. So he left mm-hmm. her, and that's when okay. he... Um, he still lived in Canada, but he would go to the South for work, as we see in the film. He's just kind of like a traveling person like that. But then again, I think he they also said something that he liked the South. Like, he loved Southern culture, but he hated slavery. He was slavery, very, yeah. He, yeah, kind of ahead of the times in that sense, too. Um, because I guess he also had a black wife that he ended up Ooh. having kids with. Yeah. And I guess even after all this happened, he decided to stay in the South in Marksville. I believe that's what the town's name was. And he stayed there even though, you know, there was still the risk of it being revealed that he was the one who helped um, Northup. But he stayed there and he lived, I guess, the rest of his life there. And there's not really anything more about him. But, yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about (laughs) him. And, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was cool because he was, like, so ahead of the times. Like, he hated slavery and he thought it was disgusting. Yeah, that call whole so the movie is like so spot on with the book that they there are some instances in the movie that they pretty much like took verbatim what Northrop wrote in his book. One of the scenes that they did that was the scene where um Bass is talking to Epps 
And I just thought that was such an interesting conversation because I feel like if if I were Epps and a slave owner and all of that, and I was having this conversation with this hired worker who's clearly an abolitionist and all of that, I don't think I'd keep him around on my plantation. Yeah. I think I'd be like, you are going to conspire with my slaves, bye bye type of, like, mm-hmm. I was really surprised that he stuck around even after revealing, oh, well, the, you know, it's a sin and, you know, the law will change and all of that type of stuff. And they argued about it, but it was just, I was kind of surprised mm-hmm. that he didn't think anything would come of his views against slavery. <laughs> like, okay. I think also it had to do with one, he was white, but also he was of lower class than Epps was as mm. well. So I think anything Epps might have taken from Bass was like, he probably thought like, I'm just going to take that with a grain of salt because you're literally nobody to him. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like he's not really sense. someone who has like any type of status. So that, I mean, that's what I would think why he didn't really care For sure. about it. But I totally agree. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just really cool. Before I talk about what happened after he was freed, do you want to talk about Patsy a little bit or what you found on her? Yeah, I can, I can talk about her. Yeah. Let me talk about Patsy. Oh my gosh. Okay. I feel also so briefly. Over- yeah briefly briefly so this movie came out in 2013 and yeah and it's just it's crazy to see lupita nyango now and everything that she's been in because i was like almost all the way finished with this movie and i was like hold up a minute i think this is like lupita's first movie and like the movie that like made her famous and she won an oscar Right off the bat mm-hmm. for this. And I was like, dang, you go, girl. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but I, like, completely forgot that this was, like, the movie that, like, did it for her. It's pretty cool. Oh. Man, I should have also said this in the beginning, which I totally wanted to. But the first time I watched this movie, which we were in college, we were, like, the year before we graduated, yeah. was when this movie came out. I did not appreciate this movie half as much as when I watched it, like, the other day or this week or whatever. Really? I was... I don't know, maybe because it was just kind of really long, but I don't know. So I must have not been in the mindset to watch a long ass movie um, about slavery. Yeah, this movie didn't even, I mean, being on Lincoln again, comparing it to that, this movie did not seem long to me. Like I saw it, what, it's like two and 20 minutes or something like that. It was over two hours. And Mm -hmm. like compared to Lincoln, that's also like two hours and 30 minutes. And like Lincoln, I had to like take freaking breaks. But this, this movie. I don't know. It was just, it was good. I recommend it. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> Rough, That's what I'm saying. good. Yeah, I don't know why I was not as appreciative of it mm-hmm. as it was, but this time I was just like, oh my God. Like, there were many times where I was like, I felt like I was super, like, on the verge of tears. And, like, I was just like, oh my God. Um, it was making me feel all the feelings. And yeah. yeah, I just really, 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 really liked it. So let's talk about Patsy, who her, her, her life and story is pretty sad. At first when I was thinking, oh, I'm going to look into Patsy because she was kind of also someone who was there alongside Northup throughout his entire, you know, life as a slave. But there wasn't really much on her. Basically, what Northup wrote about her is kind of all there really is about her. One of the articles I found on her was essentially about a quest this journalist went on to try and find some more information because obviously after watching the film, they were very intrigued by her story. So they even Mm -hmm. like went to the South to looked up all these old records, trying to find any information they could find on her. And basically they didn't really find much. They kind of found Mm -hmm. some like documents of when she was being sold and whatnot. But, but yeah, there's not really much about her. Um, But I will get back to that article a little bit after I talk about (laughs) stuff that we do know about Patsy. So Northup met and became friends with Patsy when he came to Epps plantation Patsy is believed to have been born around 1830 in South Carolina. She was sold to Epps when she was 13. She was known for her ability to pick large amounts of cotton. And I believe Northup called her like the queen of the fields or something like that because she was so good at picking cotton and the amount of cotton that she picked every single day. As we also see in the film, Patsy was hated by Epps, Epps's wife, Mary. And Mary would try and bribe workers and slaves to kill Patsy, but no one would which I'm sure is probably because they were afraid of Epps. Yeah. Yeah. Northup wrote in his book, describing Patsy as a joyous creature, a laughing, lighthearted girl, which I thought was kind of really sad because, I don't know, even all this crap was happening to her and she was still kind of a happy individual. It's heartbreaking Mm -hmm. to me. I'm just like, no, Patsy. Like, I really want to know more about him. I think ever since the film, I think a lot of historians are actually in the process of trying to discover more about her because of this film. And I think they're just... Mm, Good. Yeah, I know. Like, exactly. I was like, yeah, they need to. She needs to have her story told for sure. 
Patsy was often whipped and had many scars on her back. Northup wrote that on one occasion she was scourged to the point of near death because she had gone to a neighboring plantation for a bar of soap, which we see in the film. When mm-hmm. Epps found out she had left his plantation, he had four stakes hammered into the ground and ordered her hands and feet to be tied to them. She was stripped naked and Solomon was then ordered to whip her. After hearing the mistress whispering in his ear to, to discipline her, Epps then took the whip himself until, as described in Northup's book, she was literally flayed from over 50 lashes. Salt water was then poured over her wounds. He wrote that after this experience, he and Patsy were severely traumatized and that he had never forgotten what Patsy endured during the time he knew her. When Northup was leaving the plantation, he said, Patsy ran from behind a cabin and threw her arms around my neck. Oh, Platt, she cried, tears streaming down her face. You're going to be free. You're going way off yonder where we'll never see you anymore. You've saved me a good many whipping, Platt. I'm glad you're going to be free. But oh, the Lord, the Lord, what'll become of me? Northup then boarded a carriage to freedom and he never saw her again. <laughs> that part like, was so sad. sad. I know. Like, she didn't say as much in the movie. But like no. reading this, I was like, oh, my God. Like, that's like. That would be, like, so awful. Like, the one person that was there for you. I know. Yeah. Even in the film, like, it it has to be just really difficult because, one, obviously you want to be free and you don't have to deal with that anymore. But then it's, like, ooh, like, it's hard to, like, imagine, like, you're on your way to freedom and you are looking back on all those other slaves that you've been with for however many years Mm -hmm. and you're just, like, they're still there, like, having to deal with all the crap and torture and everything that you also had to deal with and yeah it's just yeah. Like, that's like ugh. i don't i feel like if that was me i just i don't i obviously i would leave but i i know i feel like i would just not be able to like i don't know sleep and like Let have like, a, like a, yeah. yeah exactly they'd stay with you for sure oh definitely so now back to the article i was talking about earlier just a quick little thing <laughs> that i actually saw on a different thing when I was trying to research more about Patsy because the article was brought up in, in this thing as well. So this article was written and apparently in the comments of the article, someone revealed or they left like a link proving that Patsy did survive until at least 1863. I guess there was another article written about her or something. 10 years after Solomon was freed in a letter printed in a New York state newspaper, the Mexico Independent on June 18th, 1863, Captain Henry C. Devendorf, a union officer from upstate New York, told how he encountered a slave named Bob near Bayou Booth. Bob was one of <laughs> Epps' slaves, and the New York soldiers had a chance to converse with him and confirmed that Epps was his master and that he had known north of Patsy, wrote De- Devendorf in the letter written in May 1863, and she said, went away with our army. Oh, wait. Sorry, I guess Devin North wrote this about Patsy. Um, mm-hmm. Went away with our army last week, so she is at last far from the caprices of her jealous mistress. So, I mean, that... Yeah, theme... it was 1863. That means that she's fe- freed. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, they're saying, like, somehow, like, this officer, whoever this was, Devin North, mm-hmm. crossed paths with her. So, I mean, I don't know. But, I mean, it's very hopeful. So, I mean, I'm hoping that is what happened because I feel like she deserves a happier ending to her life than what she had to endure from the age of 13 because yeah no she i really hope that they come out with even a movie about her later on kind of telling her life once they hopefully find out more information about her because yeah her her story definitely needs to be told so i had an interesting side note fact on that so there's that scene that's pretty hard to watch just just for solomon's reaction and everything um when she asked solomon to end her life because she can't handle it anymore apparently that is a like misinterpretation of a line in his book because he refers to both epps's wife and patsy in like the same passage but only uses she he doesn't say Mm -hmm. their name so i guess the writers of the movie read essentially saying oh she she wanted to die or kill her and you know bury her somewhere where she'll never be found type of a thing which is kind of what she says in the movie but that was really kind of what you were saying mary i think was that her name Mm -hmm wife was saying that that she wanted someone to kill patsy and bury her where she'll never be found but they interpreted it completely different so that was a pretty interesting like blunder Mm -hmm. i guess Mm -hmm. comes to the book and the script so i thought that was interesting kind of makes a a big difference honestly oh yeah definitely (laughs) on on both the character of patsy and epps's wife because she was a pretty angry lady but like the fact that she's like trying to get these people to murder somebody and dispose of the body like that's pretty dang intense 
<laughs> yeah. So. I mean, dude, her character in the film and just obviously her as a person, just she's evil. I think yeah, just as evil as her freaking husband. Yeah. I know. I thought it was interesting, the the part where he said that he'd get rid of her first before he gets rid of Patsy. I was like, damn, girl, you better shut up. <laughs> like, he put you in your place. Well, I mean, like, she, she was like a miserable person. I mean, yeah, they're just miserable people. And, like, that's what, like, is crazy to me, too, is how can people be that freaking evil and, like, have, like, no, like, compassion or, like, I don't know, like, humanity or anything. Like, they just are evil freaking people. Yep. And they found each other. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I'm like, that's what I'm saying. How did they even get married unless it was like arranged or something? Because they clearly have like no capacity for love. Like that's what is how I see it. Like <laughs> who knows? Maybe I don't know, once they got slaves, it like changed something deep down inside of them. I'll talk a little bit about what happened once he was freed, which is pretty much what the little blurb at the end of the movie says, but they don't actually show it. So Uh, Northrop was one of the few kidnapped free black people to regain freedom after being sold into slavery. Represented by attorneys Senator Salmon P. Chase of Ohio, General Orville Clark, and Henry B. Northup, Solomon Northup sued Birch and other men involved in selling him into slavery in Washington, D.C., As Solomon Northup and Henry Northup made their way back to New York, they first stopped in Washington, D.C. to file a legal complaint with the police magistrate against James H. Birch, the man who had first enslaved him. Birch was immediately arrested and tried on criminal charges. However, Northup was unable to testify at the trial due to laws in Washington, D.C. against black men testifying in court. Birch and several others who were also in the slave trade testified that Northup had approached them, saying he was a slave from Georgia and was for sale. No note of his purchase was made in Birch's accounting ledger, however. The prosecution consisted of Henry B. Northup and another white man asserting that they had known Northup for many years and he was born and lived a free man in New York until his abduction. With no one legally able to testify against Birch's tale, Birch was found not guilty. However, the sensational case immediately attracted national attention, and the New York Times published an article about the trial on January 20th, 1853, just days after its conclusion and only two weeks after Northup's rescue. Following his acquittal, Birch demanded charges to be filed against Solomon for trying to defraud him of Northup's $625 purchase price by falsely claiming he was a Georgia slave for trade. Northup, eager to prove his veracity and his, of his own story, urged the trial to proceed. Upon the advice of his lawyer, Birch withdrew the complaint against the protests of Northup. Northup knew that a trial related to Birch's complaint could only rebound against Birch and make him look bad. If Northup had in fact claimed to be a slave from Georgia, it would not have made sense for him to risk his freedom days after regaining it by contacting the law to bring charges against Birch. At the time, Northrop did not file a legal complaint against the men with the circus, Alexander Alexander Merrill and Joseph Russell, which is their real names. They were using fake names when they introduced themselves to Northrop. At first, Northrop had trouble believing um, they could be complicit, which I had said earlier. He had trouble believing that they were the ones that may possibly helped her, aided his abduction. Uh, later that same year, Solomon Northup wrote a public uh, wrote and published his memoir, Twelve Years a Slave, in 1853. The book was written three months with the help of David Wilson, a local writer and journalist. Published by Derby and Miller of Auburn, New York, in the period um, in the period when questions of slavery generated debate in the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, by Harriet Beecher Stowe, was a bestseller. Northup's book sold 30,000 copies within three years, also becoming a bestseller. When the book and case were publicized, Thaddeus St. John, which I was like, Thaddeus, (laughs) Thaddeus St. John, different Thaddeus, a county clerk, a county court judge in nearby Fonda, New York, recalled having seen two old friends, Alexander Merrill and Joseph Russell, traveling with a black man to Washington, D.C. at the time of the late President Harrison's funeral in 1841. He saw them again while returning from Washington, but they were without the black man. They wore and carried new extravagantly expensive items like ivory canes and all this fancy stuff. And uh, he recalled an odd conversation with them during the first trip. They had asked him then to call them Brown and Hamilton when in company with the black man rather than Merrill and Russell as he knew them. After contacting authorities, St. John met with Northup. The two recognized each other from the first encounter on the train in 1840. With this identification, Merrill and Russell were located and arrested. 
but don't get too excited. <laughs> the New York trial opened on October 4th, 1854. Both uh, Northup and St. John testified against the two men. The case brought widespread illegal practices in the domestic slave trade to light through, through testimony during the court case. Various details of Northup's account of his experience were confirmed. The respective counsels argued over whether the crime had been committed in New York, where Northup could justify, testify, or in Washington, D.C., outside the jurisdiction of New York courts. After more than two years of appeals, a new district attorney in New York failed to continue with the case, and it was dropped in May 1857. Washington, D.C. authorities declined to prosecute Merrill and Russell, and no further legal action was taken against those who had allegedly kidnapped and sold Northup into slavery. Womp. Which they say at the end it's just upsetting <laughs> very upsetting yeah after regaining his freedom solomon jo- rejoined his wife okay i have i was like i gotta ask you did you get the impression and i don't know if again i just like had a lapse of like listening to what he was saying and like after i thought about the scene a little more i was like i think there was a context clue when the sheriff asked him who his family was i think that was the clue of oh his daughter's name is this and his wife's name is this and it just like completely I don't know flew out my ears or something like that because when he was when he was when he rejoined his family I like had the impression that his wife got remarried which like I wasn't surprised because that happens but like I was watching I was like oh no that's so sad because she's like this is my husband and it's like first of all how are we supposed to know what his grown children look like and and he also hugs her first so I was just like oh that's his wife I don't know who all these adults in this room are anymore like these are this is a new cast of characters (laughs) so then it's like yeah what did you think I don't know I, I think I understood. I think it's because she looked older, the wife. And, like, I yeah. think also I recognized who the wife was from the beginning of the film to the end. Okay, and maybe she, I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, and they just made her look kind of older. And then well, also it might actually, you know, I think, like, did I read the ending? I might have read the ending before oh. I watched it. So maybe <laughs> okay. that's why I knew, too. You know, I do that a lot. So maybe yeah. that's how I knew. That has to be how I how I knew because I feel like when I watched it, I had like no trouble like knowing like who yeah no was it who. was definitely really kind of strange because he like embraces her first and they like have this moment and then everybody else is kind of standing in the back of the room you can't even really see them really you just know that there's his it's all his family and then she's like oh this is my husband this is your grandson and I'm just like what is happening here and it wasn't until I like r- was looking over the cast and like reading more later I'm like oh Margaret is his daughter that was his mm-hmm. daughter and husband who she's now married because she was like seven then I think it was when he was abducted, and and the grandson named Solomon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing I was um, confused about is I thought the wife's name was Margaret because when he, you know, when he was writing the names on his violin, I thought mm-hmm. for some reason all three of those were his kids. And then I later on I was like, oh wait, Margaret's the. I mean, Anne Mar- was whatever. Yeah. Anne's the wife. Yeah, Mar- yeah. yeah. So then, so I was like, oh, I thought Margaret was the wife. I just got like the names, I guess, confused and. Also didn't realize he would also write his name or his wife's name on the guitar. I was just assuming <laughs> that it was his kids for some reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Anywho, it was slightly confusing. But I was like, also, like I said, I like wouldn't be surprised if she got remarried because he was gone for 12 years. But I was like, that would be sad. But then I was yeah. happy. Because it wasn't what su- I thought it was. <laughs> I honestly am surprised she didn't. Like, because that was a long freaking time. Like, unless she just had faith. Because I mean, to me, I mean... T- probably more morbid but i would assume that probably at that like 12 years he's probably not alive anymore i guess is why i would assume also but then maybe she just knew that he was probably captured and he maybe you know, know maybe she just had a good feeling that he would yeah. return to them yeah and that makes me wonder like living in new york like they did like it just makes me wonder like how often that happened and like how often they would hear of that happening because it's just like if that was her conclusion oh maybe he was abducted and he will come back one day and I'll wait for him it's just like that's crazy that it would happen enough that that is even your thought Mm -hmm. of oh well maybe he was abducted into slavery he'll come home hopefully eventually and we'll keep searching for him in the meantime and not oh he just left us type of Mm -hmm. thing just like no crazy I was going to say, what were they doing the whole time, too? Like, I wonder what they were going through and if they, I mean, I'm sure they were trying to locate him. Because I, I was wondering if maybe he mentioned it in his book, too, about 
oh, and then they told me this was what they were doing. They were looking for me and blah, 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 which I'm sure they were. But yeah, so after I'll start that over. (laughs) But uh, after regaining his freedom, Solomon rejoined his wife and children. By 1855, he was living with his daughter, Margaret Stanton, and her family in Queensbury, New York. He was working again as a carpenter. He became active in the abolitionist movement and lectured on slavery on nearly two dozen occasions throughout the northeastern United States in the years before the American Civil War. During the summer of 1857, Northrop was in Canada for a series of lectures. It was widely reported that Northrop was in Streetsville, Ontario, but that a hostile Canadian crowd prevented him from speaking. There's no existing documentation of his whereabouts after this time. The location and circumstances of his death are also unknown. So rumor, rumors went a flying. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1858, a newspaper reported, quote, It is said that Solomon Northup, who was kidnapped, sold as a slave, and afterwards recovered and restored to freedom, has been again decoyed south and is again a slave. Shortly after, even his benefactor, Henry B. Northup, is said to have believed Solomon had been kidnapped from Canada while drunk. Uh, Years later, in the bench and bar of Saratoga County, which I guess is a publication, E.R. Mann mistakenly wrote wrote that the Saratoga County kidnapping case against Marilyn Russell had been dismissed because Northup had disappeared. Mann speculated what his fate was is unknown to the public, but the desperate kidnappers no doubt knew. In 1909, John Henry Northup, Henry's nephew, wrote... The last I heard of him, Saul was lecturing in Boston to help sell his book. All at once, he disappeared. We believe that he was kidnapped and taken away or killed. According to John R. Smith, in letters written in the 1930s, he said that his father, uh, Reverend John L. Smith, a Methodist minister in Vermont, had worked with Northup and former slave Tabs Gross in the early 1860s during the Civil War, aiding fugitive slaves on the Underground Railroad. Uh, Northrop was said to have visited Reverend Smith after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which was made in January 1863. Uh, Northrop was not listed with his family in, 186, in the 1860 United States Census. The New York State Census of 1865 records his wife, Anne, but not Solomon. She was recorded as married, not widowed, and living with their daughter and son-in-law, Margaret and Philip Stanton, in nearby Moreau in Saratoga County. In 1870, Northup's wife was listed as a cook in the household of Burton C. Dennis. At the, at the time, Dennis kept the Middleworth House Hotel in Sandy Hill, New York. Solomon Northup is not listed among those living at the hotel. That same year, his daughter, Margaret Stanton, and his son-in-law appeared in the census schedule of Moreau, New York, but Northup's name is not there either. Northup's son, Alonzo, is included in the 1870 census for Fort Edward, New York. His household includes only him, his wife, and his daughter. So very mysterious. <laughs> in 1875, Ann Northup was living in uh, Sandy Hill, and in census information, her marital, marital status was given as now widowed. When Ann Northup died in 1876, some newspaper notices of her death said that she was a widow. One obituary, while praising Ann, uh, says Solomon Northup that after exhibiting himself through the county, he became a worthless vagabond. The 21st century historians uh, Clifford Brown and Carol Wilson believe it is likely that he died of natural causes. They think a kidnapping for slavery in the late 1850s was unlikely as he was too old to be of interest to slave catchers, but his disappearance remains unexplained. In spite of the memoir's commercial success, Northup earned only $3,000 and his ultimate fate is still a mystery. Which I thought was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They just kind of like kind of just fell off the face of the planet. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I was reading about him, too, well, well, yeah, I mentioned how him and Anne were kind of drifting apart, which is kind of understandable considering everything he went through. Probably was not the same when he came back. Exactly. And I think he was kind of drifting from them. And I think, I don't know, to me, it would seem like he would just want to live in, like, somewhere, like, peaceful or something. Or, yeah, like, kind Mm -hmm. of... You know, so I don't know, maybe he did something like that where it's just, like, or helped with the Underground Railroad, so he had to be more discreet of a person in general, but I mean, whatever happened to him, I hope it was peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> because... I hope it was natural causes and that yeah. he wasn't kidnapped again or anything. Cause yeah. I was reading something else too, that was saying that Merrill and, um, 
what's the other guy's name? Brown. I can't remember. Um, that like they were angry that he tried to bring charges against them and then maybe set up some sort of kidnapping and killed him or something like that. And all these, you know, crazy theories, but it's just like, I like wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened. That would be awful, but it sounded like, I mean, justifiably so because he wanted these, you know, these people to be held accountable, but it's just like he had a lot of enemies. Mm -hmm. So, Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that didn't happen. Me too. Yeah, you yeah, you mentioned um that there was a theory that he may have been a part of his own kidnapping. It's debatable. <laughs> there really isn't like too much evidence for yeah. or against because some people say oh, well, if he was a part of it, he was a fool because ultimately he got screwed over and was taken away anyway. And they took whatever, you know, money deal they had made. He, they took it for themselves and all this craziness. But mm. then others were just like, you know, maybe he didn't. He was screwed over. But also if he did with that risk, like why would he risk it type of a thing, you know, because of the consequences being so great. So I don't know. I don't know. It seems very crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. It seemed no, like I, it just didn't it didn't seem like his personality, I guess. And it just like seemed like he had such a good life and enjoyed it. Like that just seems like an interestingly shady way to go about getting money, even if, you know, when it was off season for violin, playing violin, you know, I don't know. It just seems kind of crazy and extreme to me. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I did not believe it when I read it, but I was just like, that's a r random freaking weird conspiracy theory about him. <laughs> like, why would you willingly be sold into slavery? And like, oh, because I forget what they said, like what the plot of it was. But basically they would sell him into slavery and then they would show up, I guess, at like the last minute after he was yeah, already sold and be papers. like, yeah. Yeah. It was just this, like, and and Birch, the one who, you know, bought him in the beginning, he was still trying to come after, like, even though it was, like, a legit thing and all, like, he was still coming after him for that $650 and all that crazy. So it's just, like, it seemed like no matter what, they wouldn't have been able to get away with it as long as he had freed papers. Like, no matter what, they were, they were going to be screwing somebody over and they were going to be upset and would come after them for, you know, the money owed. It's just, like, y'all, that's not a very good plan. Yeah. <laughs> Any mm. final thoughts on it? I mean, I guess my final thoughts are that I am very happy that the film pretty much accurately portrayed his experiences. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> pretty much the gist of it, I guess. I don't know. I was just really happy with that because, I don't know, I guess going into it, I kind of had the idea like, oh, all these things are going to probably be changed or like, you know, different from his actual experiences but it wasn't and I thought it was really cool that they like like you said they use like actual quotes and stuff from the book and yeah my worry yeah definitely would that it would get kind of the Hollywood treatment and be very like overly dramatic and dramatized and stuff not that to say you know I'm happy that these are true events and did actually happen to him but it just makes it so much more meaningful I guess that they would that everything that this movie said was founded, you know, in, in true life and actually did happen to him and are his experiences. And it's not just like, I don't know, I guess it's just when you're learning about this time, it just, I don't know, I guess it's just, it's just better to take it kind of like from the horse's mouth type of a type mm -hmm. of thing. It's just like not, it's just easier to like believe it and like want to, I don't know, absorb it, I guess, if that makes sense. It's just, it's just better when it's not a, you know, a work of fantastical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I so. think also what this movie has going for it, because I feel like, I mean, yeah, there are movies about slavery, but I feel like this one, because it's so personal, I feel like mm -hmm. it has a more impactful yeah, it's more I impactful totally for agree. the audience. And Definitely. I feel like, yeah, I think it, a lot of people who watch it will leave with, you know, a lot of, I don't know, hopefully feelings and kind of, um, what is it? Questions, not questions, but like, I don't know, like takeaways. Yeah, takeaways from it and kind of, you know, learn and hopefully look in, more into the story and just into slavery and all that stuff just in general and whatnot. But yeah, okay. definitely watch it, folks. <laughs> Yeah, was it on Hulu right now? Yeah, yeah. it's on Hulu. 
Go yeah. watch it on Hulu, everybody. It's very good. Thanks for joining us this week on The Internet Historians. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all the podcasting places, and give us a rating. We would also love to connect with you, so give us a follow on Instagram, where we give you sneak peeks in the subjects of our episodes. Next week, we'll be discussing Michael Orr from the movie The Blind Side, so don't forget to tune in. Thanks again, and we will see you next week. Bye!